Good afternoon to all tuning in from the Caribbean islands of Ceiba, St. Eustatia, St. Martin, Bonaire, Aruba, and Curaçao. And good evening to all of you in the Netherlands, especially those of you from the Caribbean diaspora. Today we have another edition of Bay Ain Live, and we are going to be discussing various topics under the theme, An Unequal Kingdom, which was created last June during the tense COVID-19 related negotiations between the various governments of our kingdom. Today we are going to delve into what that inequality stems from, look at, uh, looks like, and most importantly, how Bay Ain and its candidates plan to counter it. With that being said, my name is Lizanne Charles, I am Sabin born, Dutch Caribbean raised. I am a poet, Calypso, Roadmatch, Soka, and children and short story writer, educator, activist, and number 13 on Bay Ain's list for the upcoming national election on Wednesday, March 17th. With me today, we have Quincy Gario, who is an artist, writer, and number two on Bay Ain's list. He is a true Caribbean, born on Curacao, raised on St. Martin with family members, the bulk of them in Aruba and St. Croix, and also with a Danish grandfather. We also have with us Kiana Huto, program maker, community connector, critical cultural consultant, and historian based in Rotterdam and from Aruba. And finally, we have with us Antonio Carmona Bez, who is a professor of international relations and political economy of development and currently serves as president of USM. Before we dive in, I just want to share with you a bit of what Bay A means to the Caribbean part of the kingdom as outlined by its position statement. Bay Ain, most importantly, is a political party that talks with people instead of about or for them. No fake representation here, but real cooperation. Bay Ain wants to redistribute power and money. Bay Ain wants to end unequal relationships between the administration and the citizens of the islands and the Netherlands. Bay Ain stands for self-determination and autonomy for all inhabitants. Bay Ain fights against structures that limit the islands to make their own decisions and fights most importantly for a new equal relationship between the Netherlands and the islands. So how does Bay Ain propose to do this? First of all, Bay Ain feels that the Netherlands must apologize for the colonial dynamics. Secondly, the people on the islands must be allowed to decide for themselves what they consider to be restitution. The Netherlands also must acknowledge and pay for the destruction of nature, the underdevelopment of education, and the missed income because of the financial policies from before 1954. All countries in the kingdom must decide for themselves how they want to design their societies and get the authority to submit law propositions. The, the council, the kingdom council of ministers must be abolished and replaced with a board where all countries across the kingdom have equal voice. The aim is for true equality. There will also be an independent board of disputes that helps when there is conflict within the kingdom. And the board will be experts from the Caribbean, South America, and Europe. European Dutch officials will no longer be seen as the independent experts. No student from across the kingdom will need a loan to study, and every student that goes from the Caribbean to the Netherlands for education will be actively supported by the Netherlands. So that is what the aim wants to mean for the Caribbean and will mean for the Caribbean once elected on March 17th. So, Having said all of that, I want to go ahead and dive right in and ask our panelists the first question, which is that the title of this program is An Unequal Kingdom, a hashtag, as I said, which was developed last year to try to mobilize um, Dutch Caribbean people around supporting our um, representatives in the negotiations about the COVID-19 related uh, health. So, why even this hashtag? Why this idea of inequality within the kingdom? What does that mean? Where does it come from? And how does it uh, look today? Um, so I think I will go ahead and give the number two candidate uh, the first um, answer. But then afterwards, please, um, Antonio, Guiana, jump in and let us hear from you. Um, thanks again for, for hosting and, and for setting this up. Um, and I think I just one um, I'm different. It's one of my great great granddads who was Danish, so not, not my granddad at all. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that makes it also a bit difficult when thinking about like that colonial legacy and the things that we're dealing with. Is that it's not just 
based on nations, it's based on the whole of Europe being involved in different ways. From iron ore from Sweden being used for chain, to grain from the Baltics initially being used to feed the enslaved on the islands, to all the different ways in which England, um, the Netherlands, France, Germany cooperated uh, in thinking through what it means to be on a plantation and to invest in plantations. So when we think about like unequal kingdom, it's also about thinking through the inequality which is baked into the system. Because the fact that we have a kingdom at all is because of what happened after the Napoleonic Wars and after Napoleon's uh, um, occupation of the Netherlands and that instead of going back to what we were as a republic, we became a monarchy. I mean, that's one of the weirdest things. And I think this year is also the year in which we're officially longer a monarchy than we were a republic. So this is also one of those things which is like to think about in terms of inequality and the ways in which inequality still has a function in, in what we do. And when we think about the kingdom and this notion of the king, one of the interesting things that I find a lot of people don't know is that the king has more power in the Caribbean part of the kingdom than he has in the European part of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself already tells us about the inequality that we're dealing with in terms of talking about governors, appointing of different governors, in terms of um, who we're supposed to be relating to and who can just dismiss governments. Um, we've had this, the situation in Stacia. Um, mm -hmm. We're looking at Bonaire and the way in which a lot of things are being introduced there, which are not conducive for the population. Um, talking about the minimum loan, talking about um, subsidies, talking about social benefits, the inequality of that whole system, and simply the fact that on Stacia still people are dealing with no water. I mean, if that isn't telling you about inequality, I don't know what is. But maybe maybe we should we should ask the historian on the panel um, for a bit more about that background. Good transition. Thank you, Quincy and uh, Nizan, for the nice introduction. I think I would really like to uh, assess this question or these notions from a more I would say personal slash also obviously my historian point of view. But um, being from a from a Caribbean island that is one of uh, that all also has, um, how do you say, um, armuda? Um, poverty. Poverty. poverty uh, problems, about 20%, I would say, in the, whole, uh, in the whole kingdom, I read upon that, um, where uh, people have this idea of Aruba being this paradise island and very much um, socioeconomically better off than most other Dutch Caribbean islands uh, in that sense. But um, if I would think of inequality, I would think of the fact that even growing up in Aruba, um, seeing the inequality in how we treat people who are undocumented and uh, treating people who are um, uh, from specific, I would say, um, family clans or family legacies who have a long colonial past on the island, uh, inequality about, um, in that sense, notions of anti-Blackness in a way that aren't being discussed. So if obviously there is, I, my literal response when you asked that question was, where do I begin? <laughs> but I, I would say this from my point of view of growing up in Aruba, also being in that sense, uh, a minority group on the island, um, yeah, dealing and seeing how socioeconomical status and, and, and resources uh, was a big way of me seeing that inequality. Um, yeah, I would like to begin with that. Okay, and Antonio? Good afternoon, sorry about that. Uh, it's great to be uh, here with you all, and uh, good afternoon and good evening to all those who are joining us from the Netherlands. Um, when I think about un the unequal kingdom and equality, I think in two spheres. Uh, one is uh, inequality amongst the countries of the kingdom, and then in the other sphere, uh, civil rights. Civil rights and uh, the, the inequality that exists amongst citizenships. 
And it's funny because I'm from uh, Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico has a similar relationship uh, to the United States that the islands have to uh, to the Netherlands. And uh, we're, you know, in Puerto Rico, we're all U.S. citizens, but we're not allowed to vote uh, in the presidential elections. We don't have voice or vote in the Congress. Um, and so I have the same situation. Uh, after 20 years living in the Netherlands, I become Dutch. I moved to the Caribbean, and I'm found also lacking the same rights that I had when I was living in in, in the Netherlands. And so when I think about these citizen, uh, the sorry, these civil rights um, and and inequality amongst uh, the citizens, I think of you know minimum wage. I think of labor laws. Uh, I think of um, you know the 10,000 uh, families that are hungry here on St. Martin uh, because they lost employment and they do not have a welfare state that can uh, can rescue them. Um, and that's just on St. Martin. You know, and that's not to mention we have similar numbers uh, for uh, uh, Aruba and uh, and, and Curacao um, as well. And then when we think about inequality. With, uh, uh, within the kingdom amongst the countries, um, well, we see, we see that the structures, there are structures that need to be tackled, structures that need to be questioned. For instance, the Ministry of Interior and Kingdom Relations. I mean, that is nothing less than uh, an administrative body of the colonies, right? And it's always remained so when we talk about Ministry of the Interior and Kingdom Relations. And so we also saw that we, throughout the pandemic, uh, we've seen how these inequalities have uh, paid, uh, played out. We have seen how the Netherlands has obliged uh, the islands, uh, the island countries uh, to accept certain conditions in order to receive uh, aid, in order to receive you know, the basic, uh, what we would consider basic rights um, of all citizens within, within the kingdom. We see that the countries in uh, the Caribbean parts of the kingdom have not uh, been given the right uh, to development and in the way that the citizens uh, of those countries or, or residents of those islands uh, feel fit. We've seen that there have been structures that have been imposed upon the islands. For instance, the CFT, the Supervisory uh, Financial Board, uh, or Financial Supervisory Board, um, and then also uh, how the World Bank handled uh, all the emergency funds and the recovery funds for St. Martin. And now with the pandemic, we also see it uh, with this new entity called the uh, the COHO, right? Uh, the uh -huh. Caribbean uh, Orhan for her forming and wickling. And um, the word Caribbean there is misleading because it was as if it belongs to us. And no, um, the representation of the islands and the people of the islands in this vision, in, in, sorry, in this structure that is to set out a vision for development, and then it's not, it's not there. We're simply not represented, or we're simply not involved. So I think that, um, yeah, there's a lot to talk about when we, when we say, you know, mm -hmm. an unequal uh, kingdom, uh, but I would see those two big spheres um, uh, to summarize. Yeah. Um, for me, I want to just piggyback exactly off of what um, Antonio said, because like even last June, when this whole thing was happening, I was like, you know, uh, very uh, critical on both fronts, so very critical of the island countries and also very critical of the Netherlands with the, to me, what I felt was the heavy handed way in which they were dealing with the governments of the, um, of the uh, Caribbean island countries, you know, and for me, I felt like, okay, I, there are these two different conversations that need to be had on these issues. Um, one on a, on a sort of kingdom level, like between all the partners and one also on a local level um, with the, you know, with the governments, with their various communities, because it's also like Guiana said, you know, like there are all of these also um, things that we have taken on from the colonial legacy that we then continue to perpetuate within our own um, society. So for me, it's, it's very complex and dynamic, but that's why I also felt like, you know, the aim was like a party that was ready to really call things what they were and say, let's come and tackle it, not just on the uh, local level and say, okay, accountability, 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 which to me, a lot of times seems to be what parties do, um, you know, in the Netherlands, they're like, okay, yeah, yeah, we want to help the Caribbean because the Caribbean needs to improve. And yes, the Caribbean countries and islands need to grow, they need to develop, et cetera, et cetera. But the Netherlands also needs to improve and also needs to be accountable for um, the, the, the whole structure and setup um, of the kingdom as is, right, and in the imbalances that exist there. So um, moving on from that, I just wanted to ask you guys, so since we know what a unequal kingdom looks like, and, and we touched upon some of the aspects of that, what does a more equal kingdom look like? Because they ain't already like laid out some of their, their points of departure, but what does it look like 
to uh, you all as uh, individuals. And anyone jump in? Well, I mean, in terms of thinking through like inequality and thinking through equality, um, to to piggyback of what Antonia said in terms of talking about this coho, this um, Caribbean structural reform organization, I'm thinking there needs to be a reform of the way how the Netherlands looks at itself and its own institutions and structures. So when we look at, for example, the way in which the new public prosecutor is installed in Curaçao, that's someone who was there between uh, 2015, 2018, went away and is now being installed again as the public prosecutor. When we talk about the, the new uh, appointment of the director of countries in the Ministerie BZK, it's someone who used to be in the management team of the penitentiary aspect of the Ministry of Justice. So what does this person know about the island in terms of thinking and talking to us, with us? Are we being seen as people to just be corralled? Are we being seen as people who can be managed with a certain type of management style? Like what is going on? And there as well, I'm thinking through this idea of like, what does, what does reform look like? And why should we as the victims of the system be the ones who always need to be reformed and need to reform? Let's talk about the perpetrators and let's talk about the violence that they perpetrated and continue to perpetrate and how that needs to be dealt with. So in yeah. terms of equality, I'm thinking it should also be equity. So there's a new, um, they're, they're talking about changing the way in which the Hoge Raad is set up. And something mm -hmm. which a friend of mine has told me, which I didn't know, is that since it's for the whole kingdom, there has never actually been someone from the Caribbean appointed to the Hoge Raad or from yeah. the Caribbean appointed to the Hoge Raad. That's one of the ways in which we can get equality. That's one mm -hmm. of the ways in which we can get uh, equity. Yeah. Fiona? Well, there are so many angles to address this uh, question, but I think, and obviously in what Quincy said, and. I would. I immediately thought about how do we decentralize a power dynamic, um, and how do we decentralize the the ones that have the power over, in this case, the system. And while Quincy was talking, I had to think about yes, equity, but also in that sense, access. So where how much access we don't have to bodies in the kingdom, in that sense, not literal literal bodies, but like the Hogerat, as uh, Quincy was saying, for example where you don't have not just um, people who pre present from the Caribbean, but also that means that you have someone who thinks with that uh, legacy in them. And it's always that dynamic. And what I see also moving to the Netherlands um, uh, from, from the Caribbean, I literally, I want to address that because I literally saw how Caribbean I am while I moved to the Netherlands because it was constantly in my face, not because the people here in general knew about the history and the legacy of even the names of the different islands uh, who, that belonged to um, the, Carib the Dutch Caribbean. Um, I was constantly needing to educate people. And that is kind of in, in a micro level, the dynamic that Quincy was yeah. also addressing, but I think most of us know is that we need to turn that around. So again, like how do we decentralize that, that, that power dynamic? And mm -hmm. um, I think one of the, the best ways, in my opinion, and that's something I think I saw in the Programma uh, Overzicht of Bijeen, is also um, like building in between spaces, I would say, or in between bodies or boards that really uh, um, have different um, belongen, like you say in Dutch. Uh, I forgot the Dutch, uh, the English word for that right now, but um, like, wh why do we do certain things and where does mm -hmm. do the resources go and who has mm -hmm. access to what? Um, yes, so that's something I wanted to mention. Okay, and Antonio, your uh, take on this? Yeah, I think uh, when we think about um, what, uh, what does an equal kingdom or more equal kingdom look like, uh, I think that uh, we have to uh, think about more participation, more popular participation, 
um, in shaping our vision for what kind of society uh, we want uh, to, to live in. You know, when, when, when The Hague was busy structuring this uh, coho, and it still is, huh? Uh, remember, Knops came down a, a month ago, and he, he supposedly spoke to certain sectors of society. One of those sectors of society was like education, you know, and here I am the rector of the smallest university in the kingdom, and um, he never contacted me. I don't know who he contacted uh, in terms of education. He did not meet with the um, teachers union. I don't even think that he met with the minister of education here in St. Martin. So I, I want to know with whom are these people talking? And, and why are we talking to stakeholders? Because, you know, in the Netherlands, we love to talk about stakeholders. And, you know, who are the stakeholders? Who's going to be affected? So I would say more participation, more transparency uh, within the structures and the negotiations that are happening uh, as well. When we think about, um, uh, you know, setting priorities, uh, the, the, the Netherlands, uh, <clears throat> what they want to do is they want to give 30 million uh, euro to build a new prison in St. Martin. Well, how about 30 million to build those schools that still do exactly. not have schools? What about giving money to the university so that, you know, that, that we could start doing our own investigation, our own kind of research, um, uh, improve the situation and the working conditions uh, of the teachers? And I also think that we have to think about um, what we need to do in the Caribbean uh, to, um, to make it a more equal kingdom. For instance, uh, yesterday, the parliament, or sorry, Monday, uh, just two days ago, the parliament of St. Martin uh, just passed a law formalizing the 12,5% reduction in civil servants' benefits. And that was one of the, uh, one, that was one of the, um, what did I say? One of the- uh, Demand. Yeah, the requirements, yeah. The requirements, yeah, the, that, that the, the Netherlands had in order for us to receive uh, aid. Um, mm -hmm. You know, did that happen in the Netherlands? Um, and I think one of the things that's very important is also to hold our politicians um, accountable. And when, you know, they are measured, imposed upon, upon the islands, um, I think that, you know, the politicians and all citizens in this side of the kingdom need to ask themselves, would you do this in the Netherlands? Would this be legal yeah. in the Netherlands? You know? So yeah. I think that we look at the structure, we so also take responsibility uh, 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 as citizens uh, to to shape the kingdom the way we need it to be shaped. Yeah, um, I think I'm um, sorry, you know, because you and I have had a couple of conversations in the past a little bit about those, and I agree with you definitely. Like you know, I, for me, that's why I, I um, you know started championing this on an, an unequal kingdom um, last June. But also, I'm I'm also extremely um, critical of of our own um, government sometimes because I also feel like you know part of why the Netherlands continues. To move this way with the islands is because um, we are not putting some demands on ourselves that we need to put as well in terms of like fiscal conservatism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But still, um, I think even with that, there's no talk or no discussion or no, or no negotiation to actually sit with the islands, meet them also where they are, have good, open, um, you know, transparent conversations with them about what they need is exactly what, like what you said. So we're going to build more prisons or build better prisons, but not invest in the areas where they actually need to be invested. So for example, the prime minister of St. Martin has said, like, she's like, listen, we said we need a better tax system. We get no funding to go towards that, but we get all of these other funding avenues that maybe we don't need right at this moment. And I think these are conversations that we have to continue to have and continue to lobby for and champion for. Um, and we have a comment. Um, so it says, talking about the fact that you have a wealthy country like the Netherlands imposing conditions like a budget cut of 5 million florins uh, monthly in healthcare during a pandemic on a small country like Aruba, just so we can receive a loan that is literally going towards making sure that people can feed their families and can have a decent and dignified living. And I think that's something that, you know, is, is, is extremely uh, ridiculous, that, um, that something that we have to also mobilize as voters again and, and you know people keep asking me like why do you want to go in the national elections why don't you just like advocate for getting out of the kingdom completely and etc and i'm like listen i i think there's room for all of those conversations but the, the point is we're going to be in the kingdom for a while whatever decisions that we make and while we are here or for however long you're here we have to have a better dynamic in terms of how we relate to each other i think that's extremely important so in a couple of minutes we're going to have well not a couple of minutes in a couple of in a minute we're have a break. I'm going to let everybody have like a last word on this section. And then we're going to take a quick break. 
Um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to move on to the next um, section, talking more maybe about the real current state and, and, and how we got here. Um, so there's a quick roundup from all of you. Like, what is one thing that you would want audience members to know, thinking about the historical legacy of uh, colonialism in the kingdom? Um, if I could say something about that, I think it's very important to I don't like to use that word because it became a hot item but the, the diversity of the different islands and the different historical colonial legacies that the different islands have because I think in seeing how um, if I would put it into more like a parent child dynamic like some islands were maybe more uh, favorited uh, by the Netherlands than others and those types of dynamics are still seen to this day. So I think it's really important for people to realize that every individual uh, island or country that was a col colony of the Netherlands has its own specific history and that mm -hmm. we need to know our own histories first. Um, so to dive into that, um, yes. Yeah. yeah, and I think I'd, I'd like to add the, the idea of the structural um, violence that was done. So also in terms of thinking through the ways in which self-governance was set up in the 1950s and that the Netherlands <clears throat> Antilles from day one, so the, the political constellation of islands before we became what we are now after the 10th of October 2010, has structurally been underfunded since 1954. Mm -hmm. So this notion of not having enough money and being forced into once again um, yeah because we're overspending and we don't know how to deal with money. I'm like, no, we've always been starved for yeah, 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 proper for sure. investment in our societies. And the thing what you're seeing is that this cabinet, or at least the cabinets of the last 10 years, have been doing the same thing here in the Netherlands. I think a lot of people forget or, or don't really even really know that in July of 2020, there were mayors and there were aldermen protesting in the Binnenhof against all of the different austerity measures which this government mm -hmm. has imposed on the Netherlands itself. So this yeah. notion that, um, that, that, that in the Netherlands they don't see what's going on, I think it's because they don't realize the connective tissue between all of this. What they're doing in the islands is things they've done which will come back and be boomeranged here in the Netherlands. We've seen it with the zero hour contracts, we've seen it with the flex work contracts, we're now seeing it with austerity measures being imposed on the population itself. So I think for me, in terms of the next segment that we're gonna to go to in terms of what to do next, it's about thinking through this idea of solidarity within the whole kingdom. Uh -huh. um, not just thinking about, okay, so what should we do in the Netherlands or, or what can we do in Utrecht and you know, Curacao and Aruba and Bonaire need to fend for themselves. I'm like, no, all of these fights are connected because the fact that we can have a guy from the Achterhoek own 10% of Bonaire, that should, you know, tell everybody here in the Netherlands that something is off. Yeah, but I think even if we discuss, like, um, you know, the way that the Netherlands said to Bonaire, like, listen, you have to become self-sustainable within X amount of years, and that means your population has to grow about by X amount of people, and then, you know, Bonaire goes, okay, but where, where are these people going to come from? And then it's like, light bulb, you know? Like, I think and that's why I say, like, we have to have these very important, very critical conversations, but I'm sorry if I hijack your uh, moment. Uh, do you have any uh, words before we wrap up this segment? Well, I, just, I, I, I agree with basically everything that was said. Um, I think if we look at the history of neoliberal uh, capitalism and how the exper you had experiments in the third world first, and then they were brought to the United States and, and, and Kingdom, uh, and the United Kingdom under uh, Reagan and Thatcher, afterwards. It's the same thing. What we see here is these experiments. See how low we can go, how, how much pressure you could put uh, on the common working people. Um, and that's what they're trying to do uh, in the Netherlands. We should take that into consideration. And I just wanted to end up, uh, you know, end with one, one thing um, or, or conclude with one thing for this, this part, uh, Lisan. And it, uh, it speaks to the, to the question that was raised here on the chat. Uh, we, really, we literally have schools that have been closed mm -hmm. for over years because they are not safe for kids to be in. I don't know how to emphasize anymore how dire the situation is on yeah. the island. I mean, you would not recognize that we are citizens of a country of the European Union and one of the richest countries. 
of, of the European Union. When you see people that are going hungry, you see schools that are in deplorable conditions, um, you know, not enough uh, healthcare uh, facilities, and that also mm -hmm. a consequence of, uh, of, of, you know, of austerity measures uh, that we've seen throughout the, the last few cabinets uh, within the Netherlands. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take um, 30 seconds to a minute, and then we'll be back with you. Let the panelists collect their thoughts for the next segment, and uh, we will see you uh, shortly. Shakia, it's this season again, sweet carnival. After 365, carnival come now the streets alive. In the burning sun and we don't care, this is we favorite time. just discussing the colonial legacy of well, the colonial history and also the, the current colonial legacy within the kingdom. And um, now we're going to move forward. We're going to talk also still a little bit about the uh, legacies and we're going to talk about how we can actually and what we can do moving forward to kind of, um, you know, sort of sort this out and, and create a more balanced kingdom. I know that there are a lot of people who actually like, you know, they said like, listen, when 10, 10, 10 was happening, um, a lot of people looked at it with a lot of fear. They were like, this is not good. The Antilles should not be dismantled. This is going to leave us weaker um, rather than stronger. And then there were others who were like, no, this is something that, you know, um, the islands need. We, we, we have all this friction within the Antilles anyway. So let's, you know, let's see what happens. So I want to hear from all of you guys. We're 10 years after 10, 10, 10, right? 10 years plus after 10, 10. How do you guys feel um, 10, 10, 10 has uh, negatively impacted uh, the constellation and positively impacted the constellation? If at all. I mean, I mean, I would, I would push back on this mm -hmm. notion of seeing ten, ten, ten as this important date, mm -hmm. um, because I think we need to actually go back to the 1970s and 1980s, and especially 1986 when Aruba mm -hmm. left the Dutch Antilles, and I think there is actually where you can really start to see the ways in which this divide and conquer um, played out. Mm -hmm. And my one of my great uncles also told me that in the 1970s and 1979, there was a hurricane, Hurricane Frederick, which barreled down on St. Martin. And so the Dutch sent over money for the rebuilding of St. Martin, but they sent it to Curacao. And then Curacao gave, got the assignment to then go and fix up St. Martin. So there is already this notion of tensions between the mm -hmm. different islands being played out. And then you have the fact that within the way how the Dutch Antilles was set up, you would have these meetings in Willemstad. And because it's like the same with the Kingdom um, Ministerraad, most of the politicians are from Curaçao. So some politicians start talking Papiamento. And then mm -hmm. the politicians from the Windward Islands would be like, but wait, we ain't understanding what's going on. So I'm, I'm dealing with this. And then you get that stress. So, I think what we have to talk about is the fact that in 1954 already, when we had the Kingdom Statute, that the Kingdom Statute is not built upon actual solidarity. It's yeah. only there because the UN told the Dutch you can't have colonies anymore. Mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. That's just something that we need to agree on. Because after, yeah. and the thing that gets me, but maybe I should stop before I start ranting, the thing that gets me is that in 1953, you had the Watersnoodramp here in the Netherlands, you know, where all the dikes uh, um, crumbled and, and there was uh -huh, like uh -huh. water damage, uh -huh. rampage. 
we sent money from the Caribbean to the Netherlands to fix it up, yeah. to help out. But not then, just then, also after World War II. It, during World War II. Yeah, well, that too. But so, right? I mean, yeah, so the yeah. thing is, this notion of solidarity and this notion of extraction mm-hmm. keeps coming back. You know, the, the islands get, get squeezed, get pushed. And now we're seeing the same thing being used in terms of offshore banking. We're looking at the ways in which the Netherlands is now promoting the islands as a gateway to South America, to companies here in Europe and the world, because the Netherlands mm-hmm. is the only country on two continents that keeps saying all this kind yeah. of nonsense. And you're like, wait, wait, let's, let's bring it back to not just 10, 10, 10, but the fact that this whole idea of the way in which we're working together is yeah. not actually working together. It's not about that. Exactly. Antonia, you want to jump in? Sorry, a very bad habit of mine. Um, yes, with, with um, 10, 10, 10, we at, uh, at the University of St. Martin, we uh, have this series uh, on uh, 10 years after 10, 10, 10. Uh, so uh, last October, uh, we uh, marked 10 years. Uh, since uh, an entire decade since uh, the, the new status, at least here in St. Martin, and of course, all the other islands as well, besides Aruba that had already left uh, the Netherlands Antilles. And it was, you know, it seemed like a very forced project. It was a very uneducated, I would say, un- uneducated project. What we're doing now through this uh, series, through this uh, blog series, uh, is, is try to discuss, you know, how, what have been the experiences uh, here on, on, on the island, at least here in, in St. Martin. And I think that we have to have a broader discussion uh, about you know, how this uh, came into fruition. What were the conditions uh, for seeking more autonomy, for seeking more self-determination? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, one thing that we have to you know, make very clear is that you know, together with receiving more autonomy, for St. Martin to become uh, a country within, it had to accept the condition of having a financial supervisory board, uh, uh, you know, controlling uh, the budget, you know, without the mandate uh, to secure uh, social spending. Um, so, so, you know, you have this body that, uh, that's on top of the government, it's on top of, uh, uh, and we see it happening again now with, with the COHO. Um, we yeah. see Entity that says no, they're not here to dictate uh, what development is like. They're not here to run the countries. The countries, of course, will uh, maintain their autonomy. Um, but if they do not comply, then they'll be allowed to take some measures. So, yeah. uh, no, uh, you know, to use the phrase that was used here in St. Martin by a celebrated author, uh, Jose Lake Jr., 101010 uh, 10, 10, uh, served as a 649, right? It's a, a six for a nine. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, what's really interesting and peculiar, speaking from St. Martin, um, is also uh, what had happened on the other side of the Concordia border, in the northern half of the island of St. Martin, uh, which is ruled uh, uh, by the French, you know. And uh, yeah. they've also, similarly, like three years earlier, they went also through this, uh, this uh, a similar process, uh, uh, trying to decide how to get their autonomy, how to get more self-determination. And um, until now, you know, we could clearly say that, you know, people are not happy uh, with the situation. So there has to be a broader discussion, um, I think, within each island, but also amongst the islands themselves. Yeah, yeah. Kiana, you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, something that um, that I wanted to talk about because of what Quinty also said, like just being in Aruba when that happened, still living there, um, because of the status of part that Aruba has, the 10-10-10 um, uh, date wasn't it kind of just was a political thing that was broadcasted on TV, but uh, internally, community-wise, so to speak, I personally didn't see much difference in that sense, uh, which you can say a lot about um, the fact that we already had a different construct and what does that construct mean in the whole kingdom, like be having a status apartheid. So that is a question that comes up naturally then for me because obviously the other islands that did have... Um, uh, Uh, felt the effects of this, um, have a different experience than that. And um, so, no, from being in Aruba, uh, when that happened, that that didn't actually make any difference at all, I would say, um, in the experience Mm -hmm. of that date. Yeah. 
Um, I would say, like, you know, just speaking quickly from um, the, the Beth Island, um, which I, like, three, four years ago relocated back to Sabre. Um, I did, like, some pooling of people asking, you know, like, what they thought were the good things and what they thought were the um, not so good things that had happened since 10, 10, 10. And so, like, for example, um, I heard, like, there was some extra money uh, pushed into education, into healthcare, into ideas about integrity, accountability, um, and then more attention to issues that are important to young people, like domestic violence, child abuse, prevention um, for at-risk youth, which were happening before, but that now they just were uh, better funded, for example, by the Netherlands, being a special mun mun municipality. But um, in areas that it didn't go so well, for example, they speak about the social minimum, you know. Um, early on, there were people within the island saying, like, listen, this is something you need to look at. Don't let this be a situation uh, with the gilder to the euro. And indeed, um, that is what happened. You know, the cost of living shot up. Um, also, like, you know, the government, the, the, the local governments have um, tasks that they have to fulfill, but which actually they don't have funding for, and they keep getting this project funding, which also doesn't allow for, like, uh, long-term planning, et cetera. And then also, like, there's, there's a growing sense, actually, of inequality in, in the way that policies um, create differentiation uh, for the way people in the Netherlands are treated and people on the best islands. And... Um, but it also, there's a democratic deficit. Um, so um, islands, you know, the islands don't have the same voice or the same um, way to to speak to um, to their own autonomy as as municipalities in the Netherlands. And so I think, like you know, um, I know yes, we have to go. We need to go way back and actually talk about the way in which this kingdom developed, and not just on our side of the Atlantic either. You know, because I have to say this, like from a personal experience. Even when I was living in the Netherlands, a lot of times people would be like, what, you're from St. Martin? Or is St. Martin even a part of the, of the Netherlands? Or, you know, like all of these kind of conversations, part of the kingdom. Um, but even recently, in 2020, I was making an observation on Instagram about Dwight the Peep. And this guy said to me, he's like, um, well, if you were Dutch, you would understand. I was like, excuse you? You know, like, but I'm like, and it's a young guy, something like, you know, also in the Netherlands, there is a, there, there needs to be accountability for the fact that they are not, um, teaching their population about what the kingdom really looks like and the inequalities that continue to exist in the kingdom, and they keep turning a blind eye to that. So um, I have two questions from the from the um, audience, and one of them is: Have all of the islands ever joined together to fight against an ill treatment of the islands? And um, the other one it says: The aim fights for recognition of slavery and remuneration. From colonists, um, colonialists, while keeping some, if not most, of the colonial instruments like religion, which only fuel and serve inequality among the people. So let's talk about the first one, maybe, and then if anyone wants to touch on the second one, um, we can do so. I mean, so the first question about uh, has has the islands ever banded together and and confronted uh, the Netherlands about the way that they're treated? Antonio, you wanted to say something. Go ahead, go ahead, quickly. No, no, you, you, no. I mean, go, yeah. Well, I, you know, I think, like, you know, the question is, has have the islands ever joined together? Um, no, we have never joined together. We've been put together. We've been put together since we crossed that Atlantic uh, okay. in chains on a boat. And if if you think about uh, the political constructions that have been imposed. Uh, which later have been adjusted through our movement. Uh, I think that if we think about reconstructing the kingdom, uh, it would have to be uh, on a consensus basis. And, and so mm -hmm. uh, I think that one of the things that we can do with uh, by aim um, in the parliament uh, is to push uh, the idea or create a space where the islands can talk amongst themselves. Rarely do we have that possibility. Right now, uh, in uh, the um, the Leeward Islands, or sorry, in ABC Islands, Aruba, uh, Bonaire, and Curaçao, uh, the the ministries of education, together with the universities of Curaçao and Aruba and IPA, the Instituto Pedagogico Arubano, they're working together to create a teacher training program. And I, this is something that I've been a part of uh, personally. And I think it was very beautiful something because it's for the first time that we as Caribbean people in the Caribbean parts of the kingdom are deciding what kind of educational system do we want. And I would like to see more of that. I would like to see that more in research. I would like to see that in, in, in dialogue over civil rights, over social economic rights, over labor rights. And um, 
yeah, I, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but uh, what, what I would like to say is that no, we have never had the opportunity, um, and now we have to create the space and we have to create the time uh, to have that dialogue uh, amongst each other. I think to to um, to add to what Antonio just said is this notion of how the islands would work together and how that could be recognized. Because, I mean, in 1969, um, you had the uprising on Curacao um, against Vescar, one of, the, one of the contractors of Shell. And then one of the people who was involved in that, in that labor rights movement, moved to St. Martin in 1972, and then in 1974 was part of an uprising on St. Martin, which mm -hmm. then caused the um, then government building to be burned down. I mean, so uh, there's a book about it called Friendly Anger, uh, The Rise of the Labor Movement on St. Martin by Joseph H. Lake Jr. And I think what that book does and the way how that looks at the way how we've resisted against these policies is that it's tried to decouple it from these institutions that we recognize and looked at it from different angles and looked at the way in which movement between the islands then led to these types of resistance movements or these types of pushbacks. And I think that also couples to like the work that's being done by um, Julius F. Scott um, when he uh, uh, writes about the way in which the Haitian Revolution traveled through ships and traveled through people, through mm -hmm. gossip, through news. And I think the ways in which we can think about resistance is also the ways in which in the Caribbean itself, sometimes resistance has been, you know, burning down plantations. Other times resistance has been simply developing your own language. So this notion of resistance between the islands, I would say the Papiamento, for example, using Kirosa, Aruba, and Bonaire is a way of working together and resisting and going away from these types of ways mm -hmm. of thinking and being within um, the way how, how colonial systems want us to think about ourselves. And so yeah. that's why like education, the arts for me, but that's also, I mean, I'm an artist and so, I love to push that to the foreground. I see the way in which we connect to one another and the way in which we learn from each other as really important. I'm a fan and a student of the work by, by Felix de Roy. I'm a fan of Jabu Arnel. I'm a fan of, of Shirelli Emanuelson, Uni Arte, and the way how she's trying to connect the arts movement in the Caribbean and seeing that as a, as a thing. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the book that's being written now by Sasha Days about Caribbean art and not just mm -hmm. Dutch Caribbean art, but the way in which Dutch Caribbean art connects to everywhere else. So for me, resistance takes different forms. And I think simply yep. existing in the Netherlands within these conditions as a political party is for me also part of that type of resistance that we're mm -hmm. looking at. But I'm, yeah. I'm going off on my tangent, so I, I think that needs to stop. Kiana? Uh, yeah. Um what I would like to say about this is that what uh, Quincy said it got me really thinking also like if again I also think about um, who has the agency for us to really work together or who uh, or, or working together or if you talk about notions of resistance um, for me it's also always a question again like I began this whole thing who has the agency who has the power who has the access to be able to voice certain uh, interests if I only look at Aruba, you have a lot of people working um, day and night in tourism, uh, working very hard, but barely get, getting around, also dealing with uh, sometimes being undocumented. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, all of those concerns, I think there are pa parallel conversations that we need to have. So you have to know your own uh, island's history and how the dynamics come to that. And then you have to have the island dynamic with in relation individually to the kingdom. And then you also need to have the conversations in the Netherlands, but also between the islands and their own yep. individual. So it's, it's all of these parallel narratives and parallel mm -hmm. uh, things that need to need to exist next to each other because if not we keep perpetuating that exactly that, that agency which is stuck still in um, certain people in power that's yeah that's i'm gonna stop there if not i'm gonna go on about that <laughs> no, no but i agree i agree and you know like for me it actually means also like um 
it is pushing back against this, what I like to call like a, a, a colonial hierarchy. And so, for example, that's why um, this show is in English, because, um, yes, I suppose all the time, people say, but why you're Dutch? Why don't you speak Dutch? Well, one, I can, but it's not the language that I am the most confident, most assertive in. And I think, like, um, if, if we're really going to say that we're an inclusive kingdom, then we have to actually speak to the strength of all of the various partners in this kingdom, you know what I mean? And, and I'm like, I can go ahead and say, like, yes, I'm going to chop up my tongue to, to, to make a point, but I can also, I think, be uh, eloquent in the language that is my mother tongue and, and that is also a part of the kingdom, you understand? And so for me, I think that we have to push back against all of these different um, hierarchies that, that says that this is the ideal, and this is, if you're this ideal, then you have voice. And, you know, I see it on table. I see it in very real ways. I've sat around tables where suddenly I realized, like, wait, this hierarchy is really at work here. Like, like you know, um, and, and, and you can be silent, so it's kind of uh, pushed aside because you don't fit the the, the, the uh, top of the, the hierarchy, so to speak. And so I think I want to just touch briefly on, on the, the comment of the person who said that, you know, they aim uh, keeps uh, various instruments. Um, I would say absolutely not. Like, they aim has committed itself to being a fully, truly inclusive uh, party and, and um, pushing back and, and being about dismantling, um, you know, all of these hierarchies and said that this is what it means for you to be able to have voice or to have participation at kingdom level or at any level actually, at, you know, um, within society. So um, we have about nine more minutes. So I don't want us to go on too long. I'm gonna go, go right to a critical question. Where do we go from here? The aim has, has said where it wants to go, dismantling the Kingdom Council of Ministers, creating something that is more equal, um, given the islands more autonomy, um, you know, having more uh, representation, diverse rep representation within uh, the trade of camera. Where else do you think um, we need to go and what do you think specifically needs focus? I think, I think for, for Bahrain, it's um, important to pay attention to the coming elections on Curacao. So mm -hmm. um, I know that, for example, René Rosalia has a party which is specifically talking about decolonization and trying to get that on the political agenda there. And I think it would be useful um, to think through the ways in which on the various islands, these types of initiatives can get a boost can be strengthened and pulled together. I think um, thinking through notions of collectivities and thinking through notions of working together, we can push back against it. Because if we're each mm -hmm. you know, solitary trying to change this, it's not going to make that much of a dent. But if you have this pressure in the Trader Kamer, in the Kingdom Committee, on Curacao, on Aruba, on St. Martin, on Station, on Sable, on Bomer, then you have a certain type of pull. Because right now the people in the Kingdom Committee, you know, some of them are trying to do the things, you know, which ways they can do, but most of them actually are not there for us. Mm -hmm. Most of the political mm -hmm. parties in the Trader Camera at the moment, in the committee, do not understand the situation on the ground, don't have no sense. Exactly don't yeah. quite know what exactly is going on, but they want to spout off about corruption and all this kind of other stuff. And mm -hmm. you're like, no, let, let's think this through. Like, what are we talking about? Exactly. Guiana? Um, so many ways, so little time. <laughs> um, but something that I wanted to, to, to mention is, again, I'm, um, I'm thinking again of like the way to move forward. Again, parallel narratives, parallel uh, being conscious about the different hierarchies, but also something more tangible. If you if you think about being more uh, self-determinated as a as an island um, and being more autonomous, I think it's uh, vital from from belong, like they say in Dutch, or it's, it's, yeah, it's a vital yeah. importance, of mm -hmm. critical importance that you have a body of of uh, uh, um, a separate entity of people who check the accountability. Uh, of what is being done and what is being said, and is is that indeed something um, that breaks down the barriers or opens up more access or uh, breaks down those hierarchies? Because I think at the end of the day, people often handle an interest 
and um, if the ones who've had agency all of those times, meaning all over the kingdom, stay in those places, but we see that nothing really changes, we need to be able to keep those people accountable also on different levels. So again, like I said, it comes down to, um, and no, I'm not gonna go that road, but what I want to say is that it's not about building bridges because I don't really believe that we're at that point yet. It's about, again, the accountability that you can have and mm -hmm. talk about, hey, what are you doing? Is that something that is feasible or good for the island in, in the whole context? on different yeah. things in education, economically, et cetera. So that's to keep it really short because of the time, what I want to add. Antonio? Yeah, I would just like, you know, to remind, uh, remind ourselves that, um, you know, Bahrain was created and was constructed by social activists. And the political platform of Bahrain is embedded in the social movements. And I think that that relationship and what makes Bahrain unique is that it is a social movement as well as a political party. Uh, you know, in the Netherlands, everyone, everybody, everybody wants to push diversity. In the universities, they want to talk about diversity. Look how Day says in Sestig, they love to talk about diversity and how they want to put more color into the, in, into the institutions. Well, Bahrain, I think, is, is, is different because it's not about putting a black woman into parliament. We've had other black women in parliament. Actually, you know, one of the biggest uh, leaders of, uh, of, of a political party uh, in the Netherlands who was a black woman was from the um, you know the right liberal party Fefe Day and that was Hirsi Ali who was you know very uh, Islamophobic and you know she had serious issues with her own community. It's not just about the color and the face. It's about you know the political line. You know how do we relate to the social movement? Are we looking at the social inequalities? Where can we uh, make an impact to improve social relations and 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 and, and to support equity? Um, within the Netherlands as well as within the kingdom. So I think that that link between uh, the social movements, our legacy, the legacy uh, of struggle. And I think that, you know, what's also beautiful about Bayan is that we're not afraid to use certain words like struggle, uh, like radical inequality. Radical is not a bad word. Radical uh, is, it can be a very good uh, word. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and I think that, um, that, you know, I think it's very important that Bayan distinguishes itself uh, from other political parties uh, by that you know, by that characteristic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you guys. We're, we're coming to the end of the show. I know we have so much more to say. I had so much more questions to ask, but we'll probably get to them another time. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you guys for coming on. Um, for those people who have not yet either visited the Bay Ain uh, page, go to bayain.org. Please share um, this uh, program in your network. Let people know that we want to create a change within the kingdom. And the only way to create a change is to also vote um, for a change, to organize for a change, as Quincy said, not just on March 17th, but that is important, but beyond March 17th, to keep doing the work. So someone actually said they aim to go to the islands and support and organize young people to form more political parties that have as their aim the decolonization and the emancipation of the islands. Young people need to get involved if we want to stand a chance. And trust me when I say they aim is about that and they want to do that. Um, it's a young party growing still. And so this just, I think, having me in uh, the Caribbean on one of the islands um, running on the list, you know, that's just a start. It's just, it's just a jump off point. So definitely Bahrain has every intention of coming to the Caribbean and creating with Korean people, not for Caribbean people, um, you know, a platform for them. Um, so I just want to say that next week we are going to be live again uh, with Bahrain Live, Live Bahrain, with Yvette, Petra, Chris, and Nano on gender identity. Also, for all the people who have listened in and who may be interested in more of what Bay Ain is doing, please go to our Facebook page. Uh, it's just uh, Bay Ain, and you can click like. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at Politique Bay Ain, Instagram, Politique underscore Bay Ain. Um, please, on March 17th and before March 17th, rally the people, especially the people in the Dutch Caribbean and also in the Dutch Caribbean diaspora. People tend to think that we're disinterested in, in uh, what's happening at national level. That is not true. I think it's just a part, again, of the histor historical legacy, and we need to change that. So mobilize your people. Go out and vote. Quincy's at number two. I'm at number 13. Of course, our party leader is at number one. 
So please uh, show support. Thank you again. And um, all those listening in and looking in, thank you and have a good afternoon and good evening. And uh, thank you as well to the uh, Schrijf Talk, so to the person who is yes. writing. Yes, that is true. De coronapandemie treft ons allemaal. Wij zien dat sommigen van ons meer steun krijgen vanuit deze overheid dan de rest van ons. Wij zien parlementsleden die het parlementsgebouw ontvluchten wanneer zorgmedewerkers een loonsverhoging moeten krijgen. Wij horen van zzp'ers hoe zij meer toetsen moeten ondergaan, meer formulieren moeten ondertekenen om juist een klein beetje bij te krijgen, juist nu hun opdrachten opdrogen. Wij horen van Curaçao, Sint Maarten en Aruba hoe zij meer autonomie moeten inleveren, juist nu de mensen met honger zijn op het eiland omdat toerisme stil ligt en stil is gevallen. Ik ben Quincy Gario, geboren op Curaçao, getogen op Sint Maarten en nu in Nederland. En ik, samen met Bijeen, samen met jullie dus, wil daar wat tegen doen. Wij moeten juist nu, juist in deze tijden, meer solidariteit tonen. Wij moeten juist actiever worden. We moeten juist binnen onze afdelingen wat gaan doen. Dus zorg ervoor dat je niet alleen deze video deelt met andere leden, maar ook met mensen buiten de partij. En word actief. We hebben je nodig.